I'm your host, Rebecca, and I recap live trials. Today, we're going to talk about day three of the Chad Daybell case. A lot to get to. There's a phone call between him and Lori. There's a lengthy conversation with him and his daughter while he's sitting in the back of a patrol car. And we've got medical records for Tammy Daybell. Was she in good health? We're going to find out. All right. So, Chad Daybell is charged with the murder and conspiracy to commit the murders of Tylee Ryan, 16-year-old daughter of his wife, Lori Vallow Daybell, and J.J. Vallow, the seven-year-old autistic son of Lori Vallow Daybell, and Tammy Daybell, the woman that he was married to. She dies of natural causes in her sleep and 17 days later he's married to Lori. So Lori has already had her trial. I don't, if you missed it, where were you? <laughs> were you out of the country? <laughs> anyway, she was convicted of the exact same charges and uh, is serving several life sentences without the possibility of parole. She, uh, the death penalty was not on the table for her. And if you're wondering what I'm doing, I am crocheting today. So yeah, <laughs> yes, lots of yarn going on. This is a uh, crochet along with bag a day crochet. She's making shawls and uh, it's turning out pretty cool. This is actually going to be a giveaway on my channel for members and Patreons. When it's finished, if you by then, if you're a member or a Patreon, uh, you'll be in the drawing to win this shawl. So going back to the case now, his attorney's name is John Pryor. We are in the courtroom at eight o'clock in the morning for day three of the testimony. Uh, last week, I feel like we've been doing this for two weeks and, and this is the start of the second week, but last week they finished jury selection and we get day one and day two, Wednesday and Thursday of testimony. And the jury has not heard anything yet about Chad's weird religious beliefs, like Chad and Lori's religious beliefs. They haven't heard any of that. That's probably all going to come in when, uh, Melanie Gibb takes the stand because she was involved in this. She's actually the one that introduced Chad and Lori. Yeah. God forbid. Anyway, so the, the day starts out at eight o'clock in the morning with an emergency hearing called by John Pryor. And he wants the judge to reconsider a ruling that he made last week. Now, John Pryor, the defense attorney, tried to get into evidence that Alex Cox, which is Lori's brother, which I, honest to God, my gut feeling is Alex killed these kids. But Lori and Chad were quite complicit in this. Yes, that's the conspiracy theory. But he is dead. Alex is dead. Alex died of natural causes, a pulmonary embolus, an autopsy was I don't know if they did an autopsy or not. Anyway, he was cremated. So uh, natural causes, pulmonary embolus. Mm -hmm. Interesting, huh? So John Pryor tried to get into evidence that back in 2007, Alex had assaulted Joe Ryan, who was Lori Daybell's husband at the time and the father of Tyler Ryan. With a taser. Now he went. To, he assaulted this guy. He was. Uh, he went to jail. Spent time in prison for this. And uh, so, the judge had said, "No, that's not coming in. It's too remote in time." So, John Pryor tried to tell him why he was trying to get this in, and he was making a record for appeal. I mean, he he probably didn't. He knew he didn't have a chance of this coming in, but he needed to make his record by asking the judge to reconsider and letting the appellate court know why it is 
memorializing why he wanted this evidence to come in. And he said it's to show that Alex would have done anything for his sister. Anything. Including assaulting Joe Ryan, murdering Charles Vallow, her prior husband, the one she was married to when she met Chad, and um, probably the children. Like, they are placing Alex Cox in the highway, and we're going to watch the bus roll over him and back up and roll over him again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because it's all going to it's all going to be Alex. All Alex all the time. It doesn't mean just because you didn't pull the trigger or whatever it is you did to those kids uh, doesn't mean you're not guilty. Chad got news for you. So in any case, the judge heard argument from both sides and he maintained his ruling. He said, no, it is too remote in time. That is not coming in. So when they had this hearing, there was, the public was not in the courtroom because it was very kind of last minute. So everybody is out. They're still in line waiting to get into the courtroom. So if they wanted to see this hearing, they were told, you know, you, it's, 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 you can watch it <laughs> on the court feed. So long crime and court TV are not covering. I mean, they're covering this, but they are not, they did not provide the camera crew. The cameras are being provided. It's the courtroom feeds. There, and there's four of the cameras. Last week, there were three, and the sound was horrible. This week, much, much better. Yeah, way better, the sound. So you can actually hear what's being said. <laughs> so uh, thank you for adding the fourth camera. Um, so let's talk about the phone call. So we hear a jailhouse phone call between Lori and Chad. Now, um, I actually want to talk about this chronologically. So we're going to talk about this officer that took the stand. He was a patrol officer at the time uh, that the search warrant was served on July 9th of 2020 on Chad Daybell's property in Rexburg, Idaho. Now, he, uh, he said that he was asked to provide security because there was at least 30 officers that showed up to Chad Dable's house seven o'clock in the morning. Now we know from last week's testimony that his son let them in, said dad's sleeping, they go up, they wake him up. So this officer said his job, he was tasked with just providing security because um, they had closed the roads and nobody was coming through while they did this investigation. They uh, they had some people that were tasked with searching the house, some people that were out in patrol cars that were tasked with watching Chad Daybell, which was, this was one of this guy's duties. And other people had, went right, the FBI evidence response team went right to that pond um, area because over there was a dog cemetery, a pet cemetery where the family members had told the officers, yeah, this is where we buried our pets. So this is where they start searching and obviously end up finding the bodies ultimately. So Chad Daybell, so this officer, he's watching the house. He's in his patrol car and he's just trying to keep an eye on things, you know, make sure nothing gets out of control. There's no media, you know, things like that that everybody's safe. He sees Chad for the first time come out of his house at around 7.30. And he gets into his vehicle and he drives over to the west side of the house, which would have given him a pretty good vantage point for watching what's going on um, out near the pond and this tree. And he spends quite a bit of time in this vehicle and he's on the phone but he keeps looking over his right shoulder, you know, which this officer said would have been looking right at the pond. So he does this for a while and then eventually he gets out of his vehicle and he walks around to the passenger side and just kind of looks around, not really doing anything, goes and gets back in his vehicle and then drives to his daughter's house. 
his daughter lives like they said catty corner. So I'm guessing that's across the street and down a little ways. That's just my guess. So he goes over to his daughter's house. Now everybody's free to do whatever they want on the property. Nobody's under arrest while this property is being searched. So I'm going to put this down because I don't remember the rest of the pattern from here. <laughs> so, all right. Let's put that aside. Okay. So when he goes to his daughter's house, he goes in the house. Now this officer was asked, well, what did you see when she, what, what could he see when he went in the house? He goes, I don't know. I, I wasn't in the house with him. I was outside my patrol car. I don't know what he could see. So it's in this house while he's in, and the daughter's name is Emma. While he's in Emma's home, he makes this phone call to Lori. And if you listen carefully, you can hear him say, I'm at Emma's house. So I want to play a little bit of this phone call for you. Well, I'll play the whole thing. It's only three minutes long. And, but pay attention during this phone call, you're going to hear them talk about a guy named Mark Means. Mark Means was Lori Daybell's attorney. Um, his attorney's name is John Pryor. So he, they talk about Mark Means. And uh, I think that was, I think that's it that you need to know ahead of time. So take a listen. Nate at Madison County Jail. This call is subject to recording and monitoring. If you don't wish to talk, hang up now. Thank you for using Telmate. Hi, babe. Hello. Are you okay? No, oh, they're searching the property. The house right now? Yeah. Yeah. I'm at Emma's. Mark means we'll be talking to you. Okay. Well, are they in the house? No, they're out in the property. Are they seizing stuff again? They're searching. Mm -hmm. There's a search warrant and so when I just did them was with the jibs. Okay. So, yeah. I tried to set up a, a call. I'm glad you called. Yeah. And we'll see what transpires. Okay. Yeah, I don't. What do you want really... me to do? Pray. What? What do you want me to yeah, do? Pray. <laughs> pray. Um, yeah. Okay. What can I do for you? Um, I'm feeling pretty calm. Mm -hmm. I would call Mark or Katie. Just talk with him. Have you talked to him already? I did call him, yes. So he knows what they're doing? Yeah. Okay. It's okay. Call from somebody else I need to talk to. I love you so much. Okay, I love you. Should I try to call you later? Um. I don't know. I I don't know. Uh, you can try. Yeah, I'll answer if I can. Okay. I love you, and we'll talk soon. Okay, baby. We love you. Okay. Love you. Good night. His affect was so weird during this phone call. It really was very flat. No emotion. Like, well, I mean, I think he said it all when he said at the end, uh, it'll work out. 
It's all in God's hands. Yeah. It's all in the Lord's hands. Okay. We're letting Jesus take the wheel here. That's why he's, he's not worried. Because, you know, he's on a first name basis with Jesus. Now, we don't know that the jury knows that he's on first name basis with Jesus. Yeah. So, him and Lori. Jesus, they know Jesus very well. Okay. <laughs> so, yes, very weird. Okay. So, he comes out of the house uh, after, uh, you know, I guess after this phone call. He At some point, he comes out of Emma's house. Chad does. And this officer is still watching him. And he's coming out like he's in a hurry and he gets into his vehicle and he takes off. Now, this guy, he's getting on the radio to tell the people that are assigned to follow him that they need, need to follow him when a couple of other officers, because there's officers everywhere. Like I told you, there's over 30 people on the scene. They, they tell him, hey, go go get this guy. So he follows him and uh, for quite a distance. And then they finally get him to pull over. And, you know, because he's accelerating and that kind of thing. They get him to pull over. So this officer uh, handcuffs him and puts him in the back of his vehicle. Now, he is not under arrest at this point. No. But this is the point where they bring his daughter, Emma, to him. Now, there is a camera rolling inside of this police car. So we get to see him talking to his daughter. Now, the lighting is terrible, um, probably because it's, you know, early in early morning or by, I don't know what time it is by now, by the time all this goes down. In any case, there's all like his affect is still flat. I'm not going to show you this because it's lengthy. It's very difficult to hear. And the recording that the courtroom recording kept repeating itself. It, there was some glitch in the courtroom recording from yesterday and it was because it, it would just certain parts of it would just keep repeating over and over so you'd fast forward and then it would happen again it was weird just really weird so i'm not going to show you that so the first thing he uh, you know she's crying she's blubbering oh daddy oh, i didn't think i'd get to see you and you know you just saw him he was at your house <laughs> So he tells her, uh, he, first he says he wants his wallet. So the officer helps him because he's in handcuffs. They're in front of his body. But, you know, he's trying to reach for his wallet. So the officer hands him, gets his wallet, looks through it just to, you know, make sure everything's nothing in there he's going to hurt himself with. Gives him his wallet. It's just credit cards and stuff. So he's going through his wallet and he tells his daughter, I need you to go to the house in Mark's room in the top drawer to the left or whatever. Uh, he gives her directions which drawer to look into. There is $9,000 of cash in two white envelopes. Okay. And uh, I heard 90,000. I know that I'm not the only person that heard 90, but most people say, no, it was nine. And it makes sense that it would just be nine. Like who's got $90,000 sitting in, well, who's got $9,000 sitting in cash at their house? I don't. Anyway, but it's much more likely that it was 9,000 than 90,000. But in any case, so then they're talking about, uh, he wants to give her the password for the bank in Hawaii, the bank account that he and Lori opened in Hawaii. Um, he tells her that he's been paying $30 a week on Lori's commissary. He's been putting $30 a week. Could she keep doing that for him? That's so, I wonder if they're still doing that. Because I, I don't know if I mentioned it, but that phone call that he had with Lori, that is likely the last phone call that they ever had together. Because inmates don't get to call each other. And he was arrested shortly after that phone call. I don't know that they ever talk to each other again. And it's been years now. So Emma says to him, well, I've been talking to Lori. So now this, the kids, his kids, his five kids know about Lori now. Now this is July. They got married back in November. So they know about Lori. Lori's in his life. They're married. I don't know when, I don't know if they know when he married Lori. If they knew this at the time, certainly they know now. And they're all supporting their father, which is kind of weird. So the defense, John Pryor has said, we're going to hear them take the stand in their father's defense. So Emma tells her dad that, yes, yeah, she's been in talking to Lori. Um, 
she said that the officers today, that they've all been very kind to us. Um, she said she has texted um, John Pryor, his attorney. He talks about that, you know, the mortgage is paid up till July 1st. The car payment's not due till July 15th. Could you, you know, you might want to set up auto payments for those things. And he says, but I, I'm not coming back. How prophetic of him, right? So he tells Emma that uh, he and Lori have some suitcases in the baby's room. And could she get those and just put them in the garage? Yeah. So this is when he tells her it'll work out. It's, it's all in the Lord's hands. Did I say that was part of the phone call? It was part of this interview. I apologize. It wasn't part of the phone call. It was, he had asked Lori to pray for him. Forego the blowjob because we don't have conjugal visits, <laughs> but because <laughs> she's like, what can I do for you? I know that was bad of me. Okay. Sometimes I just got to go there. Okay. So, <laughs> but he tells his daughter, it's all in the Lord's hands. So Jesus has taken the wheel. All right. So the next officer that comes on, he got medical records for, from Tammy Daybell. Now Tammy allegedly at first, the coroner, not the medical examiner, because in, in Rexburg, they didn't have a medical examiner. They had a coroner, which is an elected official, not even a medical examiner, who came out and said, okay, she died of natural causes. They wanted to do an autopsy. Chad says, no, we're not doing an autopsy. And he tells them she's been in good health. No autopsy. So uh, she is laid to rest. So this officer, he requests two years of her medical records and he gets one office visit one office visit in two years her past medical history noted she had anxiety depression and anemia so she's taking uh and she's taking tramadol a pain medication which is you might as well just take Tylenol, folks, because Tramadol ain't doing nothing for you. Um, it's a, it's such a minor, minor pain reliever. I think it's just something that the doctors hand you to say, hey, we prescribed you some pain medicine. There you go. Just take the Tylenol. Anyway, she's taking Tramadol because apparently she fell in the driveway a couple weeks before her death and injured her arm. So she was taking this Tramadol. She was also on an antidepressant. But otherwise, in good health. She hadn't been to the doctor in two years. This visit was September of 2019. Like a month before she's died. She goes to the doctor. Yeah. Very, very well. Very weird. So they exhume her body. And this was all done in one day. I did not know that, that it was all accomplished in one day. And as John Pryor points out, without notification to the children that this was going to be done. Now, I'm not so sure that they're required to notify anybody, but they weren't, nobody was notified. They go, they exhume her body, drive it to a medical examiner, have an autopsy, come back and bury it all the same day, all done the same day. Super, super interesting. All right. That's where we're going to leave off for the, uh, that day of, Chad Dable testimony. I will have day four recap for you tomorrow on Wednesday. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that like button, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.